Man, we serve such an awesome God. Man, I'm glad that you're here for service today. I've loved the series that we've been in, How You Know When You Grow. The life of uh, uh, this journey of faith that we're on isn't a stagnant life. It's, it's, it's not this life that you and I have just arrived at some destination, and now we can just calm down and take it easy. No, the, this journey of faith that we're on is always this progressing that should be happening in our lives. We should always be going to another layer of what God has for us, another level of what God has for us. And so I've loved looking at this series to say, what are some of those markers along the way to know that we're on the right path and that we're becoming who God has called us to be. Uh, the first week we defined spiritual maturity. What does that mean to be a mature believer? What does that mean to be a mature Christian? And ultimately the easiest way to define it, and I'm, an, I'm a simple person and so it can't be too complicated, otherwise I would get lost. And so, so the simplest version of, of a definition that we can have for spiritual maturity is you and I becoming more like Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate picture of what a spiritual mature person is. And so the more and more we become like Jesus, then the more we're progressing into who we're supposed to be and who we're called to be. And so I've loved this series as we've looked at this. And, and so we, today is part three, and I want to talk specifically about this issue in a believer's life that I believe is one of the most fulfilling and thrilling things that when you cross this line into this level of maturity as a believer, it opens up this, dirt, the, this world of wonder for you. Yeah, I believe that there is nothing more thrilling, satisfying, or meaningful than being used by God for a purpose greater than yourself. You, you, know, you were created for more than just the career that you have. You're created for more than just the education that you get or the family that you have. Those are all great things, but you're more than just punching a time clock, getting a, a salary, having a white picket fence, retiring, and then spending as much as you can so that you don't leave it to the people that want it, right? <laughs> There's more to life than that. God has a greater thing for you to be a part of. And here's the thing is that I believe that God has something that he wants to use you for that is a greater purpose than yourself. And, and I know you're all that, okay? I know that you're amazing. I know that you are a phenomenal, amazing person, but I also know that you don't even come close to what God really has planned for this world. And so serving yourself is just a sliver of what you could experience serving God for a greater purpose. And, and so such fulfillment comes from serving God. And so today I wanna to talk about serving. I wanna talk about this heart to do something with your life to impact eternity. And I believe we all want that. I believe we all wanna leave a mark here that, that extends to our families, that extends to our kids. Some of y'all have grandkids or pushing great grandkids and, and you want to leave this legacy and this mark that changes generations. You know, that's one thing that I pray over Cole and Addison is that God has a purpose for them and that they can do all things through Christ who gives them strength and that they will change their generation for God. Those are the things that I pray over them because I believe that. And I believe that about you also. And nothing in this world can compare to the thrill and significance of being part of something that is God's purpose for this world. In fact, uh, Paul writes a lot about this. And one of the foundation scriptures, even for Ovation Church, that God put on my heart when we launched the church was Romans 15, 20, where Paul says, my ambition has always been to share the gospel where the name of Christ has never been heard. And Paul says, this is my ambition. This is what woke him up in the morning. This was something that he was passionate about that woke him up in the morning to be about something that was greater than himself. And you and I as believers ought to have that element in our lives too. So how you know when you grow, if you're taking notes, how you know when you grow, serving becomes your passion. Serving becomes your passion. It should be this driving force in our lives. Now, now I wanna just preface what I'm gonna say 
with two things, two, two groups of people in here. Number one, the first group is that if you're at Ovation Church and you're not currently considered a volunteer, you're not serving on a team, take a breath. This message's point is not to make you feel guilty. Okay, I, I, I'm not gonna make you stand up at the end and we're not gonna point and laugh, okay? <laughs> That's not what we're gonna do. Next week, we'll see. But this week, no. <laughs> So, so, so if you're not currently involved on a serving team, the, the, the point of this message is not to make you feel guilty and bad and like you're a bad Christian because of that. Okay, so deep breath, release that. If you are serving, this isn't to pat you on the back and tell you that you're all that. Okay, this, this is what I want for today. I want us to look into scripture and see what the Bible has to say about how serving can impact our lives when we do it with the right heart. And all of us learn that together. And if you're on the receiving end of that, then you can appreciate how God's using them in your life. And if you're on the giving end of that, then, then, then this is a rallying cry for why we do what we do. And, and so we can all celebrate this. So I don't want there to be that tension in here like, oh great, he's just gonna ask me to volunteer for something. That, that, that's not this, okay? I mean, you could volunteer if you want, but that's not what I'm actually like, 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 gonna, like, like it doesn't culminate to the end of check a box somewhere or else you're a bad Christian. That's not where we're going with this. This is about growth. This is what it says in Ephesians chapter four, verses 11 through 15. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus and he says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. The, those are called the fivefold ministry. That, that's a church term, the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. To do what? To do all the work? No, to equip his people for works of service. Say service. service. That's this idea of serving. Did you know that oftentimes in the Bible where that word service is? can also other places be translated ministry. And, and so what this is saying is that the fivefold ministry is for the purpose of equipping his people for works of ministry. And so you're a minister, I'm a minister. If you've crossed the line of faith and received what Jesus has done, if you call yourself a daughter of God or a son of God, if you've crossed that line of faith into his kingdom, then you're called to be a minister, is what this is saying. To equip his people for the works of service so that, this is the purpose behind it, and this is the result of it, so that the body of Christ may be built up. Say built up. Built up. That's that progression that needs to happen in our lives. Not that, that we've crossed that line of faith, we set a prayer somewhere, we checked the box that we're now a Christian. Some of y'all over the last couple of weeks have checked the box on the worship guide that you've uh, accepted Jesus as your Lord or, or checked the box that you're recommitting your life. That's not the end of your journey of faith. That's the beginning of your journey of faith, that there should be some building up that happens after that point. And what are we supposed to be building to until we all reach, say all, See, even if you think you're done, the person sitting next to you is not, okay? And so there's still some work to be done until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. And what? Become mature. This is for us being coming mature, attaining to the whole measure, the fullness of Christ. I pray that you and I are on this journey and track together to attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Not just a part measure, but the whole measure all of what God has for us. Uh, the uh, president of Lifeway Research did some uh, research into serving. And this is one of the statements that he said after all this research with multiple churches from around the nation. Ed Stetzer said, growth leads to service and serving leads to growth. It's deeply connected. And I found that in my own life. I have found that in my life that, that when you cross that threshold of being a uh, somewhat of an immature Christian to where you're being the, on the receiving end of it and you mature a little bit and you start giving back, that there's a level of maturity that happens when that's ready to happen. But then also when you start to serve, that serving is one of the ways that God matures us. And so it is true that serving is the result of being mature and being mature even further is the result of serving. And so we hit a plateau in our lives if we don't step into using what God has given us to make a difference for him. 
And, and, and so that's part of this growing process. And many people have this misconception that uh, being called to ministry is pastors and missionaries or staff members at a church, and, and you think those are the people that minister. But what we read in Scripture is different than that. What we just read is that those pastors, those missionaries, church staff people, or key leaders within church, their purpose isn't to do the ministry. Their purpose is to train Christians to do the ministry. That's what the Bible teaches us. And that's such a vital element in our growth, but so often we think that's for those other people. Those nuns, that's who God will use. But I believe that God wants to use you. God, you see, you're a stay-at-home mom, God wants to use you. You work at a construction site, God wants to use you. This is Texas and we got Odessa and stuff. You, you work on the pipeline, God wants to use you. Okay? God wants to use each and every person that has crossed that line of faith as a minister, a representative for him. The, the truth is, is that you've been given a ministry. Now, now, that could be scary to some people. You think, oh, oh, oh I've been given a ministry. And, and in response to that, there's either this pushback like, no, not me, I'll mess it up. No, don't trust me with ministry. Uh, here's the thing is that whenever we think in terms of that, it, it it's this, can be this weighty burden that we reject. Uh, I like what Pastor Rick Warren says is that ministry is simply this. Ministry is when you use your God-given talents to help someone else. That's what ministry is. We're all called to be ministers. When you use your God-given talents in a way to help somebody else, that is ministry. And, and so you can be in any uh, uh, area of career or industry, and, and if you're an accountant and you do that as unto the Lord, and, and you help people with their finances and use your gifts in a way that benefits them, that's a ministry. You, you can be a police officer and use your skills and your talents in that form as a way to help people, and that's a ministry. Whatever you're in, uh, doing, if you're doing it as unto the Lord and using your God-given talents to do it in a way to help and benefit people, you're involved in ministry. We've all been called to ministry in that sense. In fact, this is what it says in Galatians 5.13. It says, for you have been called. For you have been called. See, Paul writes this to the church at Galatia. That's Galatians. He could have written this to the church of Texas, and it would be Texans 513. Burlesonites 513 is what it would have been. And it says, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedoms. This is so key. Don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's the call of a believer. That's the call of a Christian. You've been called to live this way. You've been called to serve. You've been called to a life of ministry. Now, now we usually have, on a negative side, we either embrace that and engage with that, or we, on the negative side, do this pushback for two reasons. We either feel like we're disqualified or we feel like we're unqualified. We feel like we're disqualified because we think of all the bad things we've done and we, you, you'd be sitting there saying, Jesse, if you knew, if you only knew the thoughts that I had this week, if you only knew what I did to end my marriage a couple years ago, if you only knew the search history that I've been deleting, if you only knew I am so disqualified. And we all have that issue of, I'm not there. I, I, I've messed up too much. My sin is too great for me to have ministry. We don't, we think, wow, no, that's for somebody that's cleaner than me. And so we often think that we're disqualified. And then also unqualified. And we would think, I'm just not good enough. That person should do it because they'll do it better than me. And we would see other people that understand God better, that, that do things better than we do, and we say, I'll just sit back because I'm not as qualified as they are, and I'm going to let them do it while I sit here. 
let me tell you, push back from both of those. If there's a sense of disqualification, then the things that are in your life, all you got to do is repent and turn. God is gracious. God is forgiving. And here's the thing is that when we mess up, not if, when we mess up, that then we think we've ruined it. We think we've lost it. And maybe years have gone by and you had this dream that God could use you and you say, no, it's been too long. I'm disqualified now. Let me tell you, God can restore. God can bring uh, increase where you thought there couldn't be any increase. God can put you right on track and where you thought you lost it, God can bring it back. That's for somebody in here today. Somebody get excited about that. So it's not too late. God can use you still. And if you think you're unqualified, every single person in the Bible wasn't qualified. Every, I'm not qualified. In fact, if God is using you for something that you can do on your own because you're qualified, you're thinking way too small. You're thinking way too small. In fact, God is going to call you to do something that makes you uncomfortable, that's going to make you sweat a little bit, stay up a little bit at night wondering, is it going to work out? Because I don't know if I got this. And then in that moment, you say, God, I need you. That's exactly what he is going to do. So maybe you feel disqualified. Maybe you feel unqualified. Push that back. That's a lie from Satan. God's got a plan and a purpose for you. He's called you to be a minister. He's called you to serve and make a difference. That's the reality of it. That's the truth of it. In fact, this is what it says in Ephesians 2.10. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. God wants to use you in his plan for this world. And, And this is the truth, is that God is great enough. God is sovereign enough to accomplish his plan with or without you. But his desire and his invitation is for you to be a part of his plan so that you can reap the benefits of participation. He's going to do it either way. The, the, the reality of it is, is whether or not you're going to participate and get the benefits of participating, or if you're just going to sit back on the sidelines in what his plan is for your family, for your workplace, for Ovation Church, for your community, for the nation. God wants to use you to make a difference for his eternal purpose. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. You were created to be a contributor not a consumer. You were created to be a contributor, not a consumer. There should be this passion in our lives, this ambition that drives us to use what God has given us for eternal purposes. There should be this passion. There, there's this heart issue. Not, not just doing tasks, not just checking off a checklist of to do things so that I can feel like a good Christian or anything like that. No, but there should be this driving passion in our lives to make the most of the time that we have here to make a difference for God's kingdom, to be about kingdom building issues and, and, and focused on that. There ought to be this passion in our lives. What do, what do you think of? When, when I use the word passion. What do you think of when I use the word passion? I was thinking about this, uh, how it relates to other areas of life where we'd think, wow, that person is passionate about that. I, I, I was thinking about sports. There are some people that are really passionate about sports. I, I, I'm not so passionate about sports. I enjoy watching sports if I got the free time. And so I'll watch it and I don't even know which team to root for. If they got it like, like a, if they're from Texas, I root for them. But, you know, but go Cowboys. Ah, oh, yeah, go Texas Rangers, Mavericks, you know. Um, who's the hockey team? Um, who's the, no, nah, I'm, I'm kidding. I am kidding. Dallas Stars. You know? and so, so here's the thing is that, that man, I, I enjoy sports, but, but I'm not that into sports. We, we had a connect group a couple weeks ago. It was actually July 4th. And so uh, we went over to, um, some of y'all maybe know the Blanchards. They, they hosted it that week and did this pool party at their house. And it was 4th of July. And the, the, the TVs that they have outside on their porch, uh, we were watching Texas Rangers game. And I don't even remember who they were playing. It was another team with gloves also. And so, um, <laughs> and, uh, but there's some, uh, there are some people in the church that, man, they know the stats of the players. They know other teams that the players used to play for, where they're going, and, 
And, and they know this. They're passionate about sports. You, you, you've seen the people that are passionate about sports at the Super Bowl or, or in the playoffs where it's 20 degrees up in Green Bay and the cheese heads are half naked, painted different colors. It's like, that's passion. They're passionate about that. That's passion. I was thinking about uh, people that fish. People that fish, man, they got the gear. They got the lingo. They, they know the, the lures that they're using. The, they know w the temperature of the water and the type of baits to use at different seasons and, and the color of the water. So use a chartreuse color, whatever. You don't even know what chartreuse is if it wasn't for fishing. It, 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 but they're passionate about it. And they have a boat that's more expensive than most of our houses because they're passionate about it. Passion leads you to do some things that other people that don't understand look at you and think, they're a little off. <laughs> it's like, you're not normal. You, you care too much about that. But when you're passionate about it, it makes sense to you. It drives you to this. Think about people that, that hunt. There's no reason to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning and, and, and like go out when it's cold and, and wet and, and you sit there for hours hoping that, that the perfect 10-point deer comes along. Hey, man, I think that's a big deal if it's 10-point. I don't know. Maybe a 12-point. I don't know. I just don't know. <laughs> but, but the best one, and you're waiting and you're waiting and you're so passionate, you'll get deer urine and spray it on yourself. <laughs> It's like, dude, I can smell your passion from here, right? It's like, like man. But, but passion leads you to do some things. And, and scripture calls us to have this passion to serve him. This passion, to, this ambition to, to use our lives, to throw our energies behind something that matters for kingdom building purposes. And that, it, that, that should be true in our lives if we're just going to be a disciple, not, not, not a full-time minister, not a, not a church staff person. This is just to be a disciple of Jesus. This is what the Bible says. If you're taking notes, write this down. We do not serve God out of obligation. We serve God out of passion. If we're going to do this right, if we're going to answer the call that God is calling us to, then we're not going to serve God out of obligation. It's not because I have to, but we're going to serve God out of this passion this ambition and desire to use our lives for something greater than ourselves. You know, we have to serve out of the right heart. We're not saved by serving, but we are saved to serve. We're never going to serve so that we can earn something with God. We're not going to serve so that we can earn some sort of salvation. In fact, salvation is the foundation from which we can serve. Without salvation, without experiencing God renewing us, then there is no foundation there for us to serve others. We ha In fact, if you're taking notes, write this down. Uh, this is a catchy phrase that a lot of other churches have used and uh, even have t-shirts about it. And it's a great phrase. It's good to remember. Saved people serve people. Saved people serve people. When we've experienced the transforming power of God in our lives, when through God's grace in our lives, we've overcome our bumps and our bruises and our bad habits, it frees us to be able to serve others and help others. And that's what God ultimately wants to do in this track of growth in your life is that as you renew your mind, as you are being transformed, as you work out your salvation, that you come to a place to where you can help others get through some of the stuff they're going through so that even your misery can become your ministry, so that even the hardships that you faced, God's goodness can work through those to help other people that are facing hardships. The, the, this is true is that saved people serve people, that God has changed us and transformed us. And as a result and a response to that, he first loved us, now we're going to love God, and we're going to love people because of what he's done in our hearts. And that is so important that we see that connection between loving God and loving people, that they're not separated. They have to be together. This idea that I can love God and serve God, but it has nothing to do with serving people, that's not in the Bible. In fact, this is what the Bible says in John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21, it says, if anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, 
He is a liar. Those are strong words. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God he can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. In fact, I believe that serving people is the outward expression of an inward love that we have for God. And if we have this inward love for God, the only way that that's expressed is by loving people who are made in the image of God. And that's got to be this reality and this passion that drives us. There's two points that I want to make. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. When serving is our passion, we will serve people selflessly. When serving is our passion, we will serve people selflessly. And one of the greatest barriers to serving is selfishness. In fact, Paul, what we read from Paul, Paul said, don't use this freedom to fulfill your own selfish, sinful desires. This work that God does in your life and this work that God wants to do in your life isn't just for your own benefit, but it's supposed to be used to serve other people. This idea of selfishness of, well, if I serve, what do I get out of it? If I serve, then what about me? That's always going to trip us up. That's not, but if you're passionate about serving, then you willingly sacrifice all, lay down yourself for the cause of Christ. That's what we're called to do. In fact, this is what Jesus talked about in Mark chapter 8, verse 35. He says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. You see, God is calling us to be selfless, to be sacrificial in our lives, to lay down our own pleasures, our own plans, our own purposes, to serve out his will around us and to allow him to use us to make an impact around us. You know, there's a famous story in scripture right before Jesus is crucified and he washes the feet of his disciples. And in an ultimate act of serving those around him, Jesus takes the towel, wraps it around himself, gets down on his knees and washes the dirty feet of his disciples. And after this powerful moment of Jesus being that example of serving, this is what he says in John 13, 14 and 15. He says, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. We're called to serve others. And if we're going to serve with passion, then we're going to serve selflessly. Number two, if we're going to serve with passion, if serving is our passion, then we will serve people enthusiastically. Then we will serve people enthusiastically. Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 12. He says this. He says, never be lazy. He says, but work hard. Say work hard. hard. Serving God can be some hard work sometimes. It's not always easy. It's not always convenient. It, it, it takes work. Sometimes it causes calluses. Sometimes it causes you to get dirty and sweaty. Sometimes it causes you to really want to fight internally. And you have to say, no, I'm not going to give into these emotions. I'm going to work hard to push that aside to do what God is calling me to do. There's some hard work that has to be done. And serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to participate or to practice hospitality. That's what we're called to do. This enthusiasm, this passion, this excitement for what God is doing and we get to be a part of it. That's a mark for somebody that is serving with the passion that God has called us to. That's something I really have not had to struggle with in my Christian walk. In my journey of faith, I absolutely love the local church and I would give up all sorts of other things to be able to participate in what a church 
church does to bring hope to people, to bring hope to a community. A, 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 a school or an education isn't going to do that. A hospital isn't going to do that. Governments aren't going to do that. It's the local church that represents God and God's plan and furthers the cause of Christ. And I want to be a part of that. And, and so I've always had this passion to participate in what God is doing, specifically through the local church, even though this ministry and serving isn't only in that. It, it's in every area of your life that you can do as unto the Lord and serve him with this passion, not just to do the least required, but to go that extra mile and to say, I'm going to show up early. I'm going to stay late. I'm going to do what isn't even asked of me because I'm going to serve with enthusiasm. I'm going to serve with purpose. I'm going to serve with this passion to make a difference for Jesus. And that is something that God honors so much. That is something that when, when people have that heart and that attitude, God shows up and does some great things. And, and we see that over and over in scripture as, as the disciples, even under uh, uh, oppression, even under opposition and turmoil, they served God with such enthusiasm, they changed the world. And, and when a group of people gather together with that common cause and that common purpose, God shows up and does amazing things. That's the hope of the world. That is the hope of the world. The, the church isn't an organization. We are the church. And when the church, we serve with enthusiasm and passion, God changes the lives around us. God uses us to do that. And this is what it says in Colossians 3, 22 and 25. It says, servants, do what you're told by your earthly masters. And don't just do the minimum that will get you by. Do your best. Work from the heart for your real master for God, confident that you'll get paid in full when you come into your inheritance. Keep in mind always that the ultimate master you're serving is Christ. The soul and servant who does shoddy work will be held responsible. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. Uh, in that last line, being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. Being a follower of Jesus is not an excuse to get by with bad work. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. And, and I say that because sometimes I hear people have the wrong heart and the wrong attitude when it comes to ministry, and they say, well, it's just a volunteer anyway. Oh, are you kidding me? If I had a big enough Bible, I'd... <clears throat> and then I'd repent. Maybe. <laughs> but but that, that attitude... That, well, it's just for the church? Oh, that irritates me. And I wish that people would have this passion that we see in scripture because God does amazing things when people have the passion to say, God deserves our best. God deserves all I've got. And I may not be perfect, but I'm gonna try my hardest. And when we have that attitude, God shows up and uses us for some great things. And that's what God wants to do in our lives. And so I absolutely love that. The last verse I wanna share with you. And I want this to be your heart's desire. I want this to be exemplified in all of our lives. And the reality of what the psalmist knew when he wrote Psalm 8410, he says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Listen to this. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. I would rather serve in God's kingdom and use my life for something that matters for eternal purposes than spend my days doing something that the world may think is amazing, that may feed into the pleasures of my personality, but no, I'm going to reject that and use my life for something that matters for kingdom <laughs> purpose. That should be our rally cry. That should be this heart desire that we have is that I will serve God with this enthusiasm and passion. And when we do that, God shows up and does amazing things. Let's pray. God, thank you for this message. Thank you for the call that you've given us. God, thank you for the work and the plan and the purpose that you have for our lives and for our families and for our community and for our church. And God, thank you that you've asked us and invited us to participate 
in your kingdom purposes. And God, I pray that we respond with passion in the privilege and the opportunity to be used by you for something greater than ourselves. God, we say yes to that call. As we're praying, the heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If there's an area of your life where you recognize that maybe you haven't been fully serving God, maybe with that passion that you should. Maybe in your workplace, you've been turning negative and you need to push back from that. And you need to say, no, I'm not doing this for some earthly master, God. I'm doing this and serving unto you. And God, even if my boss or my coworkers don't recognize it, God, you're the rewarder of my faithfulness. Maybe for some of you, you've been so concerned with the issues of life and the concerns of life that you've put your plans above God's plans. And you know that God's called you to participate and do something. And you've just been saying, well, the timing's not right or this condition or that or unqualified or disqualified. And it's time for you to say, no, God, I'm going to just say yes to the call. If God's speaking to you, the Holy Spirit's tugging on your heart right now. And you know this message is addressing this issue in your life that God's already spoken to you about. I want you to raise your hand. I see your hands. I see your hands. Leave your hands up for a moment. I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hand. Thank you. God, as they raise their hand, God, I pray that that's not just some emotional response, but God, that is their heart's cry. That is evident of their heart's cry to realign their passion with your passion. God, that you would break their heart for what breaks yours. That they would begin to see people through your eyes of compassion. And that God, the love they've received, the forgiveness that they've received, then God, they will in turn extend that to the people around them. That they would use their God-given talents to help the people around them. And God, I pray that their eyes are open to those opportunities that you bring around them so that they seize those opportunities to make a difference and that they would spend the short amount of time that we have on earth. God, that they would invest their energies in something greater than themselves, that they'd participate in your kingdom purposes and make a difference for eternity because of the gifts that you've placed inside of them and the opportunities that you bring to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God a hand this morning.